intelligencesquared.com. Given our, given our time limits, you can do in your, in your summation speeches. Uh, you're all going to vote again. You're all going to vote now. You're all going to vote again on this motion before us. And you're going to have, we're going to have two or three minute long speeches summing up from our panelists. Uh, I ask you to vote uh, as the cards, you all have the cards in front of you. Again, if you are in favor of the motion, namely that London's climate change policy should begin in Beijing, rip the card in half and put that part into the box that comes around by the ushers. If you are against the motion, <laughs> if you're for it, put the other part in the box that comes around. Uh, it, it's rather straight enough. <laughs> if you still don't know, then please put the cards unattached, undetached rather, put them intact inside the boxes. They're coming around. Uh, now, the, my one final request to you is that you do this quietly. Excuse me. My, my one request is that you do this silently because we're going to listen to summation speeches from our panelists of two to three minutes on the motion at hand. London's climate change policy should begin in Beijing. So uh, we'll start in the reverse order uh, which, in which we heard our first opening speeches. So we'll start uh, with Malcolm. I, mean, I think the first thing I'd say is, sadly, and it's always an embarrassment of debate, but presumably you're on our side because you believe that the UK shouldn't have a climate change policy unlike everybody else in the world, uh, and therefore that that has to be done in London because nobody else has that point of view. I mean, my own view is, look, the world is warm enough for us to live in because of the natural greenhouse gas effect. That was established by Arrhenius in the 1890s. The, the Earth is, is uh, 33 degrees of temperature warmer than the moon, and that's largely because we've got an atmosphere that traps uh, sunlight through the water vapour and the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If you look at the infrared absorption spectra of water and carbon dioxide, they exactly match what we know goes on in the atmosphere. And it seems to me obvious that if you both come up with a whole lot of new gases that fill in the gaps in that infrared absorption spectrum, and you add more of the gases that cause the absorption, then the odds are very heavily that you're going to see an increase in, in climate change. It's certainly true that the science isn't settled in its detail, but the burden of proof lies very, very solidly against those who, who would argue that there was something else going on that makes the world warm enough for us actually to have evolved in and live in and have wonderful things like, uh, like UKIP to entertain us. Um, to, I mean, broadly speaking, I think I'd, I'd say that, uh, you know, as simple as this debate, we don't get to run China's policy on climate change. Of course we should contribute to it, and indeed we are, and there's a lot of uh, good work going on at the end of this. But I don't see how you can support this motion and not be implying that it's not our responsibility to start looking at our greenhouse gas emissions. It's not that our greenhouse gas emissions are ahead of the world average, which is all that important. It's that they are a lot further ahead of what is sustainable. That's the real point uh, about this. And we have that responsibility, uh, I believe, to be taking the lead in our own actions here, and that's where our climate policy begins. But actually, I don't agree with the point that it ends there. It doesn't end in London because, of course, uh, climate, carbon dioxide is a unique pollutant. It's the only uh, global pollutant we know. Most pollutants we know are regional or local and can be dealt with regionally or locally. Climate change has to be dealt with globally because it doesn't matter where the greenhouse gases are emitted or when particularly because we're looking at so many decades into the future. And that has to be a global solution. And of course we have to look at the uh, country which, if it's not already the biggest carbon dioxide emitter, will be within two or three years. <coughs> it's quite possible that today was seven billionth person day. It's quite possible the world's population crossed the seven billion mark today. Uh, and it hasn't stopped yet. Uh, and the idea that we can continue to be emitting at the levels that we are in the UK and leave any sort of world worthwhile to the future, I think, means that, that very definitely our, our policy on climate change has to begin in the UK, wherever it would then lead us in terms of international uh, cooperation. Excellent. Thank you. Vicky? Well, I mean, the more I've been listening to the questions and also the answers, it seems to me that there is definitely a confusion about the motion and that we are almost in violent agreement in some of the areas. Um, I don't think that either Simon, who can speak for himself, was, or, or I, I suggested that there shouldn't be any policies at all in, in the UK. But we should really um, chase the sort of size. Um, I mean, China's going to be important, it's going to be growing. Um, what we do won't matter hugely in terms of changing things in the world overall. But of course, it matters in relation to our own values and 
our own, if you like, ex you know, the way we price externalities and our own um, welfare function. Uh, but the problems that exist are that nobody can actually agree on pricing externalities, and that has been an issue. Uh, we still don't have a carbon tax across the world to be able to even do anything pro properly. Uh, and my concern is that just doing bits in one place without really getting agreement across, and it was a, a very valid question as to what we may get next, um, and what we should be pushing for, could actually lead to greater distortions than, than, uh, than we'd like to see. Certainly as economists could lead to misallocation of resources, the wrong types of energy policies developed. And what we need to be doing is working in conjunction with the Chinese and others to ensure that the right approach is, is uh, adopted um, internationally. Now, you say that it's difficult to achieve. Uh, maybe the Chinese won't listen to us. Uh, maybe. But I think, as I said myself, that once they reach a certain level of income, I think green is going to be very important for them. And everything that Simon has said in terms of how much they're spending in this area. And also, frankly, the benefits that they can get themselves by developing <coughs> green technologies, which they will, with help from us originally, they will major in as a major source of exporting in the future, um, is going to actually drive them that way anyway. Excellent. Thank you. George. Well, thanks. Um, the motion is a confusing one, and I don't envy you having to, to vote on it. Um, but if we are to try to stick to what it kind of means, we've got one proposer um, in the form of Simon pretty well arguing against the motion, and, uh, and quite persuasively, really. We have another in the form of Vicky, uh, another in the form of Vicky, who doesn't actually want any carbon cuts at all. Um, she, uh, let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that in order to come in at no more than two degrees of global warming, we're going to have to bring down average global emissions to around one tonne per person per year. According to Vicky, five tonnes isn't yet enough, and, and we should see an increase in those emissions. Now, that, that, that's no climate change policy. That's anti-policy. That, that, that's a policy which has nothing to do with what we are trying to establish here because it doesn't actually tackle climate change. But what I'd really like to do, because of this sort of slightly confusing motion, is to push it to one side and say, the only way I think we're going to sort this out is by denationalizing the question altogether. It's not about London, it's not about Beijing, nor is it about the UK and China, nor is it about any particular national emissions. We've got to start looking at this in global terms rather than in international terms. And see that we've got a common resource in the form of the atmosphere, and it needs to be dealt with by us as global citizens. And I think what we need to do is actually scrap the entire Kyoto system with all its national emissions and the rest of it, which has been so destructive, so impossible to negotiate at the international level because of that horse trading, because of everybody engaging in carbon nationalism. And we need to have a global cap with a global trading system, a cap and trade system, which actually just comes down and down and down, brings down emissions, and, and it doesn't really matter that much where those emissions take place. So in a way, I'm proffering an olive branch to the other side, saying, let's dispense with the motion, let's agree to some actual practical political proposals, as well as economic ones, and I do think the politics are extremely important here, as well as the economics, which, we, which, which would actually break through the deadlock which has prevailed at Copenhagen, has prevailed at Cancun, will undoubtedly prevail in Durban, and will in 2100 prevail in Murmansk when we're sitting beside the air conditioning units saying maybe we'll move it to Spitsbergen next year. <laughs> Thank you very much. Before we go to the last person we'll hear from for the evening, uh, to Simon, um, uh, let me just comment on, on the motion itself. I actually asked uh, our organizers uh, before, uh, just as a journalist, I said, uh, that motion uh, doesn't seem like the best one. Uh, and they said, well, uh, and I said, Is, are we open to you know, anyone changing that? And they, and they said, well, you can just criticize Intelligence Squared. So there you have it. <laughs> um, Simon. That, well, you've all voted now, so it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like democ democratic elections. Um, you know? And kind of, George, you're wicked, but that's okay, because that's what you do. So, so um, <laughs> China doesn't have a climate policy. It has an economic policy, and it, that's embedded within a, a national plan. Um, as far as I understand, the UK has a climate policy, but doesn't have an economic policy. Um, <laughs> And, and so 
that, that creates a sort of different kind of a problem. Um, I, I think what we've ascertained um, it is that, that what China does will obviously impact on the UK, which has been part of my argument, um, and that what China does will impact hugely on the climate, subject to 89 caveats, and that was Vicky's comment, but uh, yeah, everybody agrees that, that what we need to do is not persuade them about their economic or their climate policy, but to learn from them that we need an economic policy that is a low carbon or green growth or whatever language you want to call it, strategy. And without that, the UK will advance international protectionism. It will continue to support short-termism within the financial markets, which is the dominant part of the political economy of this country. And it will go to Durban without any interest in cutting a deal. Why? Because economically, it sees that it doesn't have the strength to cope with a serious deal. China, on the other hand, will increasingly see the interest in doing a global deal as it increasingly takes leadership <coughs> in key technologies and sees key opportunities for export and overseas investment and for thereby improving the environmental conditions within its own country. I think, and it may be splitting hairs and it doesn't really matter, that the key for the UK is to develop an economic strategy that fits tomorrow. And that the argument that it should advance a climate policy and go to Durban or anywhere else to do a global deal is fatuous, not because it's wrong, but because it has nothing to do with what's actually going to happen. And until the UK has a clear, <coughs> forward-looking economic policy, it will not be able to address the climate agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. <clears throat>